Hi, this is Eric from longboxreview.com. Welcome to the show. This is a discussion that I'm having with Damien, Sleepy Reader 666. Hello, Damien. Hello, everyone. Yep, this is Damien uh, from Sleepy Reader 666, my YouTube channel. And, and uh, I'm really excited to be back. Excellent. And I'm uh, very pleased that Damien agreed to come back, even though I talked his ear off last time. Uh, and uh, although I, I don't think that that will change for this discussion, because we are continuing our discussion of the wonderful image series Danger Club uh, by Landry Q. Walker, Eric Jones, and Rusty Drake. So last time, Damien and I talked about issues one through four, which was collected in uh, the nice trade here, uh, volume one, Death. And uh, like I said, we'll be discussing five through eight. Hey, everybody. Editor Eric here. Uh, I just wanted to interject briefly to let you know that while we recorded a, an entire discussion about volume two of Danger Club, this episode, we're only going to discuss issues five and six. Which is collected here in volume two, Rebirth. However, the volume two trade does not contain the alternate issue, the alternate ending. Weird. That's surprising. Yes. yes. They like uh, those covers. They, most often nowadays, trades just have used one of the covers from the issue, but they drew new covers there. I had a question also about the trades because we kept reading the uh the little front piece of uh text that kind of set up each issue are those front pieces in the trade they are they okay. actually are so you, you I those were very important yeah you get you get the same cover that was in uh, uh in the, the the monthly issue and then you get that the inside cover piece but instead of all of the credits and everything that you see in in the the floppy version you just get the, the text, you can kind of see it here in the video, uh -huh. uh, the text with, with a background image. So I'm going to mighty glare right. on there. But that's it. That's all you get in there. Right. So it's the same background image, but now you can actually see the background image. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. So that's good. I'm really glad they included that in the, in the trade because I think those, those, well, part of the nature of all of Danger Club seems to me that their clues are hidden in places where you don't quite you think this is just a little bit of filler, but really it has important bits of information in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, just just like the uh, the the uh, retro pages, the Silver Age uh, introductions that we get for every issue. You know, there's there's something right. in there, something more than than just what we're seeing on that page that pertains right. to the rest of the story. So yeah, right. It's more than just ironic counterpoint when you get those uh, those retro looking pages. They actually have little nuggets of information. Exactly. Which adds uh, to the fun of reading this and rereading this. Yes, yes, definitely. I, I have, I've had so much fun rereading this uh, in preparation for our discussions, Damien. That I, I, I think I just need to go back and do that with all these these favorite comic series of mine because it just it has opened up my eyes to to uh, more of the depth that's in this. And not, I'm not saying that every series out there has a lot of depth to it, right. uh, but this one certainly does. And I know that other comics that, that I tend to think of uh, from my past where they, you know, that I think of them as beloved series or, or, or runs or, right. or just storylines. There's probably a lot more there than I encountered or um, uh, saw when I originally read those issues. I'm thinking of, uh, you know, New Teen Titans stuff in particular, which is pertinent because as we discussed last time, the New Teen Titans uh, was a huge influence on the creators of this book uh, in terms of the, the type of story they're telling, the types of characters that they have in the, in, in the issues. So it, like I said, it's, it's very pertinent. Uh, I wanted just to talk about yeah, briefly. Sorry, on that point that you just made, uh, thinking about our discussions about this, and the rereading of it and looking at everything more closely, it takes me back to my earliest childhood experiences of reading comic books. Cause I would get one comic book at a time. I loved comic books so much that to increase the experience, I would reread that one comic book over and over again and examine it in my childlike way, you know, to try to figure out. And this is how you sort of come to really understand comics is by, you know, trying to, like you come in in the middle of an Avengers story or a Commandy story and you have to figure out who all the characters are and all of that. 
And so as a kid, you have the time to, to really relook at these. And now as veteran comic book readers with all kinds of busy lives, uh, we usually rush right through them. But, but there's this huge pleasure in examining all the nooks and crannies. Yeah, yeah. Well said. Well put. Yeah, I, it's, it is funny, isn't it? Uh, I did the same exact thing when I was a kid, just starting out reading comics when, you know, I only got, you know, two or three at a time right. uh, if, I were, if I were lucky. And now that I'm older and I have a lot more disposable income and I do <laughs> buy a lot more comics in comparison uh, to what I did in, uh, in my youth, I, I don't tend to savor them as much as I did. And it's, it's kind of sad. <laughs> it is. It is. And yet we want lots of comics. Yes. <laughs> I must get about 50 new comics a month. <laughs> so wow. uh, you just can't spend that time reading them all, even if, even if I were a child and had more free time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's move on. I wanted to, uh, before we dive into the issues again, uh, I wanted to just talk uh, briefly about the, the, uh, the release schedule of this book and uh, a few facts about it. So uh, as, as I mentioned last time, in, or um, when I mentioned uh, previously, uh, Rusty Drake's kids were involved in an auto accident. This was around the time that they were either working on issue four or right before issue four came out. I'm, I, I don't remember exactly. I have to go back and look. But uh, that started a cascade with the, the rest of the series that led to a bunch of delays. Now, it wasn't just that incident, but that was the start of it. And because things were taking a certain amount of time to get back into it, uh, into the swing of things, uh, in some interviews that I read with uh, Mr. Walker and Mr. Jones, uh, they talked about how basically Rusty was doing the colors for this this series uh, in his spare time after his normal, you know, eight to five job. So, uh, and they didn't want to do it with anybody else. So they were they were they were willing to wait, and uh, but then you know they also had to you know Mr. Walker had had other commitments, so did Mr. Jones, so it just led to uh, some delays. So between issue four and five, which which was the split in the trades, um, there was a, a six about a six month delay. So issue five came out in April of 2013, and then we have a huge jump in time between uh, issue five and six. And so that was, uh, issue six came out in January, the end of January, 2015. That's interesting, wow. So wait, when did five come out again? That was April of 2013. April and then January. So that's um, like seven or eight, nine, eight months maybe, nine months. Wow. That's a year and another. A year and nine months. Right. If I did wow. my, my okay. calculations correct. Sorry. Because I, <laughs> I remember there being a long wait for five. Right. And I think at that point, maybe I just stopped even paying attention. And it was just a surprise when Danger Club would come out again. And see, I was, I was uh, combing uh, previews every month to see if uh, the new issue of Danger Club was being solicited. So I was very excited to, to, uh, to see that whenever I did. And as a veteran comic book reader, I think I sort of expected at that point it wouldn't continue. I mean, there are always books that just disappear. That's true, right? And and uh, since we're at, since we're talking about issue six, uh, I did read recently um, uh, an interview with uh, Mr. Walker that uh, the the series was actually intended to be a six issue series, but somewhere in between uh, when they started it and obviously when they ended it. I think it had to do more with the time delay than anything else. They decided to to uh, increase it to an eight issue series. Could that be because they had already released a four issue trade, and so it would balance out the trades? Perhaps, yeah. That that or makes maybe a lot they of sense. Got more ideas too. Well, and that that's really what they they did talk about in the interview that I read was that they they wanted to flesh out some things that uh, they they weren't going to be able to do so in just six issues. Right. So I'm I'm pleased at that. And that's uh, a great thing about working for Image that they since the creators are are driving the bus, they can change their their mind and do more issues if they want to do more issues as mm -hmm. opposed to. I think if you worked for a, a regular comic book company, you would have to 
you would have contracted out six issues, you would have to find a way to do it in six issues, at least usually. Yeah, exactly. Uh, let's see. Issue seven came out a month after issue six, and that and that is uh, once they came back with issue six, six, seven, and eight, they intended to have everything come out monthly, and that was that was their plan. That was Image Comics' uh, desire as well, and so uh, that came out in February of 2015, and then finally issue eight and eight point two or eight B, however you want to think about it. Right. Um, they both came out in uh, it. So actually, issue seven came out late February. Issue eight came out early April. So it was about a month, not not quite exactly a month, but uh, there you go. It came out, close and enough. then yeah, close enough, exactly. And then uh, the trade paperback, uh, the second trade paperback collecting issues five through eight came out in June of this year, twenty fifteen. So there you go. And issue eight, with a little bit of publicity, had two ver- two different endings. Um, which is why there's two different versions. Mm-hmm. I guess it's the last three pages that are different or the last th- four. Actually, uh, I have, I have, uh, several notes about that. I think, hold on a second. Let me, let me page through or get to that real quick. Uh, it's, it is more than just three pages, but some, on some pages, it's just a minor change in, in uh, dialogue or the text box. Uh, and other pages, it's quite significant. So we actually have, I have notes for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pages that have differences between the two issues. Uh-oh, I need to sit down and read them side by side. <laughs> well, that's what I did. I, I figured I needed to do that. I ran out of time to do that sort of thing, unfortunately. But. Well, and and I had a slight advantage there because uh, when I went to Emerald City Comic Con, and I think I mentioned this before, but uh, when I uh, went went to the con and saw Mr. Walker there, we had a, a lengthy conversation about uh, Danger Club and other things that he was uh, working on or interested in, and he showed me advanced pages for issue eight that they were black and white copies of of the issue. And he and he told me specifically that there were differences between uh, the the two versions. So I, I I knew to look for that when we were preparing for this discussion. Maybe I should have told you that. <laughs> so I apologize, no, okay. Damien. <laughs> if I had more time, I think I would have purposefully started issue eight point one from the beginning again. But I just didn't have the time, so I just sort of flipped that look. Well, it'll, um, it'll be a yeah. discovery for well, you as, as we I get to them. I look forward to rereading it again at some point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So that is, that's the, the background, if you will, for, for this second half of uh, Danger Club. Uh, Damien, shall we, shall we jump right into the issues? Issue number five. Issue number five. Has blood and a eye patch on the cover. Does not yeah, bode well for Mr. Along. Jack Fearless, huh? Right. We've thought, well, Jack Fearless has helped out in the last issue, helped out by shooting his best friend in the head. Um, so, but apparently they won't, judging. And shall I read the front piece? Yeah, please go ahead. Or did you want to sort of try to summarize it first? or? Uh... No, let's just dive right into it. Okay. There were no heroes, not anymore, only us. One by one, we would fall to the darkness that had descended upon our world. It was the end of everything, and there was nothing we could do to stop it except pray. So we've been wondering who writes those, whose voice those front pieces are in. And before we went back and forth and finally decided it probably was Kid Vigilante, but now Kid Vigilante seems to be dead. So we're once again, I, as I was reading this issue, wondering who that might be, who the we are. Ooh, but. good point. I hadn't thought of that. You're right. He he's he is supposedly dead at this point, and yet we have this this text. So, but it is in the past tense. So I maybe it's like you know, it's like Captain Kurt's Kirk's uh, um, logs. You know, when right <laughs> when he's actually as we're watching the events occur in the episode, he's actually talking about them as if they already happened. So maybe maybe that's kind of what we're doing. Are dealing so with it's here. a clue to us maybe that uh, Kid Vigilante will be back. Yeah. Well, and and it's funny too. The the I, I didn't really glom onto this until you read it. But you know the prey part, except prey, 
based on what I have seen of Kid Vigilante, that is not something that I think that he is that he does <laughs> that True. he believes in. He does he doesn't seem like a, the praying type is what I'm trying to say. But knowing what's coming up, praying links up to certain uh, things that he does turn to. Very not good. Yes. Prays. Yes. So the um we're now used to, if you've watched our or listened to our other podcast, we're used to the first page is always a sort of mock Silver Age kind of splash page. And this one's the American spirit in the terror of Dr. TikTok. And it does say America's number one superhero. And he, he looks, the American spirit looks more like um, the fighting American or the shield that mm. which were, were imitators of Captain America. Yeah, that's a, that's a good observation. You're right. I mean, that's not important, but it's just a bit of comic book trivia. Obviously, Captain America had, was a very popular hero in the 40s and had a lot of imitators. Uh, less so now, but, uh, but they exist in the history of comics. Mm hmm. And, and I just want to point out a few things on that on that first panel, you know, the, the whole idea of these um, uh, Nazi dino Nazis that right. we get. Wait, you know, dinosaur heads on these Nazi bodies. That's just that's just such an right. a silver age con. Maybe I, I don't know. It's actually kind of golden age ish to me, maybe a little silver age. But and then Dr. TikTok. His, you know, just these little details that they're throwing in here, the, the glasses with the uh, the hands. Right. <laughs> I just love that yeah. kind of stuff. Well, I, I do really like the, I, and it, it, it says here, which is a big clue for the stuff coming up. Um, the time machine, it's rewritten history and turned those di Nazis into dinosaurs. The Nazis into dinosaurs part is just the fun part, but the right. rewritten history um, is an important clue. Exactly. Exactly. And then the bottom, the bottom panel is, uh, we, we, the shocking fate of the American spirits, junior sidekick, which is Jack. Um, right. you see, you see the, uh, you see kid vigilante, uh, what was kid, kid monstro? Was that right? If that was yeah, that, his that name? must be kid monstro. Yeah. And then, uh, I don't recognize, oh, that's, that's, uh, oh boy, I should have looked it up. Uh, that the 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 girl there is um, princess power princess. I don't remember right. exactly. Power princess, princess power. Something yeah, like. yeah, you're right. Uh, and that, but then you see you see Jack, and there's his brain and one eyeball. Right. Oh, I didn't notice the one eyeball. <laughs> yeah, and I as I was rereading this because I didn't fully mm -hmm. remember, I was wondering is is Jack literally was in the real world of this comic. Was he really just left with just a brain and is his whole body something his brain was implanted to or is he more of a cyborg mix of like 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 the character cyborg in teen titans you know with some body parts left other than the brain and i think i finally get my answer to that in the last or second to last issue Mm hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, before we turn the page, I wanted to or, or move on. <laughs> I wanted to point out, notice how how young Kid Vigilante looks in that in that picture. Right. About 10 or. Yeah. Yeah. So how yeah. long has he been doing this? Because uh, right. we, we you know we talked about how uh, it was mentioned by Walker that uh, Kid Vigilante is probably 16. Mm -hmm. And here he is in in this uh, this first page, looking like like I said, tan or so. Right. Yeah. Again, there's the question of what are these comics? Are they comics within this world, or are they just some kind of I don't know gimmick at the front of this comic? I mean, obviously, they are a gimmick at the front of this comic, but but whether they supp supposedly exist in in the world of of these characters, right? I'm, I think I'll never be totally sure on that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully, you know, that's something that they could explore if if uh, if the show or the show <laughs> if the comic ever comes back. Hey, uh, Damien, we got a couple comments here, uh, Mr. Hallermouse from YouTube. So uh, he says, uh, hmm, names like. Kid Vigilante, Dino Nazis, could I be in love? And uh, and then a little bit later, he says, brain in a jar? Yeah, it's love. So yeah, 
Tyler Mouse, it is it is a a a a labor of love to to go through these issues. So if you haven't read Danger Club, you should do so. Tyler Mouse, for those of you who follow him on YouTube, has a deep understanding of the history of comics. So he will get huge amounts of Danger Club. He will get huge amounts of the subtext of Danger Club that's just full of all this uh, stuff going back to uh, to the history of comics. All right, let's well let's turn the page uh, literally here, and uh, we we come into um, people watching the American spirit. The president of the global United States uh, addressing the union, talking about the menace uh, of these the basically these these kids, the 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 group that Kid Vigilante is um, uh, leading, and how uh, comparing them to Nazis, the Nazi menace of the 1940s. He says. Uh, so, and, and, and comparing them to Adolf Hitler, I, I just wanted to point out in the, in this, this sequence here, uh, Damien, that we have these, these, uh, the, uh, teen superheroes, there, there's a couple panels here. One, uh, they're huddled together. There's three or four of them. They're huddled around this TV and it looks like an abandoned warehouse of some kind. There's right. another one who's watching this, uh, it looks like an underpass, a uh, highway underpass, and he's watching it on his phone. He's got he's got his backpack or um, right. uh, bag They're next. They're all in hiding in different places. I yeah, guess. and and uh, uh, two two things about that, that that occurred to me about this. One, why are they still wearing their costumes if they are in hiding? And <laughs> and two, do they not have anywhere to go, other than uh, off by themselves in these abandoned places like this? Uh, the, can, you know, don't they have families? To that they could hide or hide with, you know what? It, just those little details that that just pop in my brain as I'm reading this. It does seem that that their life as a superhero sidekick took their childhood away, and so they have nowhere to go. Perhaps that that, that could be very well be, yeah. And and the, maybe you know it's maybe they're maybe the the adult superheroes that disappeared in the crisis in the that w- that was talked about in the first four issues. Uh, you know, just like we found out with Kid Vigilante, um, uh, you know, he ha- that his mentor is his father. So maybe a lot more of these characters. Oh, also Gravity Girl, you know, her mom was was one of those. Uh, so perhaps, you know, it, a lot of them, it's more than just them having mentors like like Robin is to Batman, but they're actually family members. So when they're gone, when those adults disappeared or, you know, died, apparently uh, they had nowhere to go, perhaps. Right. Especially now that they've become outlaws from the pr- president, uh, uh, spirit of liberty. Or, no, wait. American spirit. American, American spirit. So I kind of am repeating some of this stuff as I'm aware some people are watching. And then we find out that these, this execution of Kid Vigilante is indeed televised to the country. Yeah, that, that president has no, no qualms about... Uh showing that kind of stuff. Could you imagine? Right. <laughs> if that stuff actually happened here? <laughs> First Obama speaks, then he shows a little execution with brains coming out the back of someone's head, and then he goes, goes comes back and speaks some more. <laughs> yeah, not, not something I want to see. <laughs> okay, uh, so then we, uh, we go to the White House. Well, not the White House. Yes, it is the White House. Um, Sorry, there's, there's, there's. We show, the, we see the ship that attacked the, um, the group, or the group attacked. Wow. Right, the helicarrier. Yeah. Uh, type of ship. But, but then, oh no, maybe it, maybe this is actually, this is actually a reproduction of of the Oval Office in this ship, perhaps. I don't know. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. I that just occurred to me as I'm not, looking at the not page. Totally easy to parse that out, but yeah, yeah, I think it is. So, but what so I, it's kind of like that this helicarrier includes a flying White House inside of it. Or something. Mm-hmm. I, I guess that totally makes sense. It's better than Air Force One, right? <laughs> right. Uh, I just wanted to point out, though, uh, in this scene or this page that we see Yoshimi. And so, you know, the, the, the very right. the five inch tall the character. Miniaturized Japanese girl. Right. And, and at first I couldn't tell where she was or where she exactly. was. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I had the same thought, too, because... You you see that soldier right behind her, and it looks like they're really close together. And so I'm thinking, oh, well, she's somehow captured in this container type thing, and, and the soldier has her. But then you go to the next page, and you see uh, her 
jumping down the backside of Jack Fearless's leg. So it looks like maybe she was in his holster. Right. I'll yeah, show, that was just that one of those one of those shots when we first see her that is not not clear where she is. But it, anyway, it's cool. So we're the cool reveal of this scene while they're talking is that uh, things as they seemed in last issue are not what they seem because if Yoshimi's working with Jack, then Jack isn't hasn't betrayed in some weird way. He hasn't betrayed the other other sidekicks. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and also in the scene uh, where Yoshimi is is uh, heading into a uh, uh, what do you call it <laughs> in, into a, a vent, yeah, an some open... kind of duct that seems to yeah. have a lot of electronic work inside of it. Yeah, and, and odd that the vent. Okay, I, I'm nitpicking now, but it's odd that the vent does not have any like grating over it. But uh, it's, it's a perfect size for, her. and and more amazingly is that. Okay, so now we know that that she was not being carried by that soldier like I thought. How did the soldier not see her in in uh, in Jack's um, uh, holster. holster? And even more so, how does the American spirit who is facing Jack, looking right at him, not see Yoshimi uh, running towards that 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 duck that vent? You found the fatal flaw in this comic. I, I did. So <laughs> everything is undone now. <laughs> right. <laughs> everything well, else is beyond this is hooked is, up um, to breathing apparatus, busy gloating on his victory. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's very true. But it's just, excuses for it then. <laughs> it's just one of those little uh, continuity things, I guess, uh, that n- doesn't quite jibe with me. So right. anyway, I, uh, another thing I'll point out on this page, uh, and Damien, I'm just going to, uh, because I don't want to keep you as long as I did last time. <laughs> Uh, I'm just going to go through these really quickly. So if there's anything on here that you want to point out, uh, you know, just jump right in too. Okay. Um, but uh, so on this page, so uh, American Spirit is taking a, a bit of delight in making Jack uh, repeat this oath. I hereby solemnly swear that I shall support and defend our nation against all threats, foreign and domestic, blah, 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 blah. And as, and as as Jack does this, as he's reciting this oath, it becomes quite apparent, especially in the panel at the bottom here, Jack is not happy about doing this. Right. In fact, he looks almost pained that he has to he has to say these words to this guy, this, this his right. his former mentor, who has in his eyes, or I, uh, if you'll pardon the joke, um, uh, has betrayed him. And and of course, American Spirit's not buying it. So he puts he puts Jack to a to a test and tells Jack to execute Ladybug. And I think her name is Fahrenheit. She's the the fire producing super powered uh, girl. Yeah, I don't I even remember her. Again, the um, the artist or the artist and writer are masters of counterpoint. So <laughs> when we have him reciting the oath. We're also seeing her, Yoshimi, the tiny girl, running through the ductwork. So we know while he's reciting the oath that that he doesn't believe in it, even before we see his face with that expression. And then we see the counterpoint of Yoshimi getting getting the work she needs done done while potentially these other heroes are going to be sacrificed, um, which again repeats the sense of all these sacrifices that are made to accomplish their mission. I mean, we've seen the big sacrifice earlier where Jack had to kill Kid Vigilante, the planner of the whole mission. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, these kids are amazing that they, that they continue to put themselves in the situation or these situations where, you know, they could die at any minute. And many of them do, uh, even in the end. Right. So uh, I, it impresses me that, that, that they show these... And not just the fact that they're, you know, they're valiant heroes, because that's what we expect in our superhero comics, but that they are also afraid and and um, sometimes unwilling to continue, uh, as we saw with Gravity Girl. And they're just unsure. You know, they're kids. They're, they're teenagers. They, I, I would have a difficult time as an adult. Uh, even at the advanced age that I am, I am approaching to, to uh-huh. I think, commit to the, the things that they are doing. So 
I, I just, but that that's one of the things I love about about. Uh, we talked last time about my love of of teen superheroes, teen sidekicks, and that's one of the things I like about it is how the these these young people make this commitment in this fictional world, of course, uh, but but they make this commitment to to uphold these ideals that they have and help help others. I think that's just a, a fantastic thing that that that, that younger people do that wish more people would follow in, in those examples. And so on the next couple pages, we also, we get Jack refusing to do it. The American spirit does torture the kids down below, perhaps unto death. And then Jack breaks free and they have a fight. And what, to me, this is an even stronger sort of representation of this idea of, um, of the heroes abusing and betraying their sidekicks. I mean, because obviously the American spirit is the ultimate betrayer. He's, you know, gone from being Captain America to being Thanos or something, <laughs> <laughs> to being dark side, <laughs> someone who, who, you know, the whole universe or multiverse is, is just a toy of his ego. But, um, so yeah, it just sort of there. There was a, an emotional frisson as we realized for sure. We've real. We've just become to realize from the first page, for sure that um, Jack was the sidekick of the American spirit, and went through awful things with his brain in a jar and then put back into a robot body and then, to be betrayed by by the person who, turned him into a superhero in the first place or mm -hmm. made him a sidekick. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And if if you take in all of these layers, it's a emotionally packed scene, an emotionally packed fight between the two of them. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah, you're exactly right. So, and the fight is is quick because we find that the American spirit is not as frail as he appears to be, because uh, right. he takes on the the uh, robotic body of Jack Fearless here. Um, and he knows, uh, American Spirit knows that Jack is a traitor from his perspective. Right. Um, and he knows in the next couple of pages, uh, as he's gloating, as he, as after he tears off tears Jack, yeah. Yeah, Jack, tears <laughs> off Jack's arm there, um, and, and callously throws it away. Uh, he knows, he knows that, 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 his, uh, as, as he says, American Spirit says, what are you and your little friends really up to? So he suspects something and, and yet, you know, the. The, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, well, words escape me at the moment. Uh, having you shimmy, uh, infiltrate as she did, as shown in the previous pages, and the fact that he totally missed it. <laughs> Even <laughs> though he was expecting betrayal. Exactly. That's, yeah, again, that's one of those gimmies. You know, we just need to do it that way so that, so that the plot can continue. Okay. Well, and I also think that that speaks to American spirits hubris. You know, he just, he, right. considering what is going to happen here very soon, um, I think he just thinks it doesn't matter. Right. Which is, which is when we did talk about this before too, why, or we brought the question up, why, why didn't uh, American spirit round up these kids as well? And, and I think you, you pointed out that perhaps he thought that they were not at all a threat. Right, and I and I think he still thinks that, even though he knows some, they're up to something. And he went through all of this with Jack Fearless, knowing that Jack was going to betray him, and he's just really enjoying torturing his former um, for, former uh, student. <laughs> and I, I'm struck. I guess I'm distracted by the wrong details, but I'm struck by the fact that inside his robot body is muscle and blood and veins and and then the president tortures him with it mm -hmm. sort of going to yet another level of kind of uh disturbingness in their violence <laughs> well yeah it does speak to to your uh, assertion that that he's a cyborg instead of just a robot with a brain in, right. in the body but it's funny because uh, things I've read from the creators, uh, they specifically talked about Jack Fearless being in a, a brain and an eye in a robot body. So, right. Well, and to skip knows? ahead, he um, later we see that his face is a robotic face too. I, I, mm -hmm. um, so I think the intent. I think they just decided to be gross, and they, they're making a robot body that still has biological parts that you can torture. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, let's see here. So uh, I wanted to so jump ahead of two uh, again. Um, Yoshimi is able to stop the torture of Ladybug and Fahrenheit here. I, I, I hope that's who that is. And uh, although providing the same feed of the torture with with the, the 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 stuff that she did inside where she was ripping up cables and connecting stuff together and um and then she says she t- she tells ladybug it's time to get to work and ladybug gets up and says oh good i thought this was going to be difficult it's just, just that <laughs> that resignation to the task at hand even though she just right. i mean she almost died here in right. in, in this electric chair situation Right. Uh, she's she's being uh, very dryly ironic, I suppose. Yes, there you go. Yeah, you put it in a much better way. In the meantime, uh, Jack is pushing American Spirit's buttons, you know, what happened after the Nazis, after right. everything we fought against. How much worse are you? And and uh, American Spirit says, don't you dare judge me. I'm a hero. Uh, to which Jack replies, you think, you think that's what Hitler said? And then American Spirit just goes crazy and Taryn... Right. Taryn out... Um, uh, uh, Jack's uh, cybernetic guts. guts, which are full of blood, along with the cybernetic yeah. parts. Yeah. Uh, blood they and and electricity. Blood in this comic book. Right? Yeah, they, yes, they do. <laughs> yeah, Rusty. Well, I, I think. Just... <laughs> yeah, I think Rusty has uh, has an issue. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I say that with love. <laughs> right. uh, let's see here. Is there anything in the next few pages you want to comment on, Damien? Well, at some point, we get we start getting the alternate reality here uh, in terms of World War II, because the war just went on and on year after year, and we were losing Japan and Germany, Italy, Canada, Spain, France. They were all too strong. So the this the reason for Captain America, the American spirit's uh, corruption, lies in the fact that that the war went a different way and the Nazis were going to take over the world. And then he says, the answer came from one of my earliest missions, one of my more colorful enemies, Dr. TikTok's time machine. So in a sense, perhaps he was a real hero until he gave in to the temptation of turning to the time machine to solve his problems, to, to use uh, the powers of God or a godlike being a godlike way of solving problems rather than solving them in a, a mortal's way of solving them. Right. And we get that, we get that old, old adage, you know, um, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. So even right. though I'm sure American spirit meant to do things for the greater good, he ended up in this situation where he is now, which is obviously right. a fascistic dictator. Right. It would be our ultimate yeah. weapon. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, but it turned out to be so much more. Notice too, that he's the way he's kind of, um, coveting that globe right. in, in, in those scenes that that'll, that'll come into play later. We'll talk about that. Yeah. It is interesting though here. He's not feeble at all. So is all of that a fake and thought about that before, if it is fake, whether it, yeah. Well, it, and and so let's assume that it is fake. It's it's merely for the public eye. His you know his constituents, right. the countries, maybe because everyone knows how old he is, so he needs to look that mm-hmm. elderly. Well, and also obviously to just uh, belie what is actually going on. You know, he is gaining in power. We'll find out, and so he just wants to hide that as for as long as possible. Right. And even I love how I mean, we've had this all along, but it just strikes me again. You know, he's dressed up like the president. He's in the Oval Office. But the one thing is he always keeps his mask on. (laughs) Yeah, that's funny. (laughs) And it just makes him seem more demented and disturbing. The mask has wrinkles in it. Even the mask is almost melded to his face. Well, yeah, there's there's there is a panel on the next couple pages where his eyes are uh, almost, if not fully closed. And. And this is oh, one of those right. comic book conceits. Right. His eyes, yeah. when his eyes close, the mask eyes close with Yeah, him. exactly. But that's just one of those comic book conceits, right, about masks. Just like, just like uh, uh, the, and we talked about this before, but the, the, um, the white eyes, 
you know, just because it's, it's just a lot easier to do that from an artistic right. standpoint than to actually draw eyes, you know, mm -hmm. pupils and everything. Uh, although I did this, I'm going off on a tangent now, but I like how they've incorporated that into like the Batman characters to where there actually are, they're like lenses now and not uh -huh. just, not just eye slits, although it depends on the artist, but I, I, so it I wasn't like, just something easy to draw. They've turned it into an actual yeah. thing. It's become part of continuity now. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. So uh, Ladybug and Fahrenheit are, are making their way towards someplace. And I just wanted to point out this con this, this brief conversation here uh, between them. So Fahrenheit's saying to Ladybug, he seriously didn't tell you the plan. Ladybug says, right? Not until we, we were crashing. I mean, who does that? <laughs> uh, he probably do just doesn't totally trust you. I mean, you were his arch enemy and he's kind of a jerk. <laughs> and Ladybug says, hell with it. We should start our own team. <laughs> right. I just I just love that. Oh, and, and she says, the punch kid vigilante in the face being a, for being a jerk squad. <laughs> yeah, yeah I just that's like a lot of fun stuff in the middle of after we've seen people tortured and. Right. And so, you, yeah, horrible things. Yeah, so you get you get the really serious, uh, gross kind of stuff interspersed with with the comedy elements. So, it's it's wonderfully done. And a reminder that that these are sidekicks from the villain side and the superhero side who have teamed up at this point, which mm -hmm. I kind of tend to forget as I go along. Mm -hmm. The craziness of this world, where every single person has a teen sidekick. <laughs> uh, in the meantime, Yoshimi is doing more than just freeing ladybug and uh she is actually so you see there in the panel that i'm showing on on the screen she is uh there's a, a view of her and then micro tokyo in the background and so she's she's hacking into something there and i I'm, you know we could we could guess probably what she's doing uh she says this is yoshimi anamoto you <laughs> mother effers you can't keep me out right well, and the infinity override is a bit of a clue because there were those robots with the infinity sign on them. Earlier. That's Oh, yeah, very true. I missed that detail. Good point. Uh, on the next page, there there is a, a sh just a quick panel, and I just wanted to point it out just because uh, it, it just, the way it's drawn struck me. So you see Ladybug here, and it looks like she gets shot. Right. And I thought, oh, my God, so there goes Ladybug. But... It's also odd in the sense of I'm not sure because it looks like she got shot through the th through the like the bottom of her throat, so that led me to believe oh, I thought it was the shoulder. Yeah, and and I'm sure that's what it is because she's not shown as dead <laughs> in the next page, uh, but just the way that that was drawn, it was to me it was a little confusing because it, it looked more like a kill shot there when I first read it. But of course, as we move on, you find out that, she, I mean, she's hurt, obviously. I mean, these poor kids. Right. Well, uh, and I thought Jack Vigilante was killed in the last scene of him being massacred by the president, but but he turns out to still be keep going a little bit. Well, he's, he's like the Energizer Bunny. He just keeps going right. and going and going. <laughs> no matter how much of his guts you rip out. Exactly. Uh, so the girls finally do... Uh, reach their destination and she sticks this uh usb stick into a console in in the the ship to what end i'm not sure yet uh yoshimi hacks into micro tokyo's the the the, uh, the gigantobots and she takes control and you you pointed out uh because I, I i i mentioned the remote control bitches and you you pointed out last time damien though that comes into play later and here it is right she right. she says it again it's her kind of her catchphrase remote control <laughs> so I wonder if Ladybug does die, though, because the last thing we do, we ever see her again. Her hand is bloody and it's like she's plugged in the USB and then she's kind of falling to the ground, bleeding everywhere. Well, yeah, you're right. You know, if you're just just going through it page by page like this and not not thinking about what comes up, uh, it certainly looks like and that that she is dead or almost dead and it makes you wonder, you know, if that was really the implication here. It, it certainly seems to me to be that way. We certainly seem to see a lot of people who would surely have to bleed out and die, <laughs> even if the oh. original wound was not a death blow. Yeah, and much sooner than it actually occurs. But again, talking about comic book conceits, that's another one, right? It's just right. 
No matter how many, guess, how much. I couldn't remember if we do see Ladybug again, but I guess we probably do. We do. We, we do. see her at. Oh, she she's in the last issue, isn't she? Yeah. The, yeah. It's starting to all blur. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there's there's more words between Jack and the American Spirit, and uh, but then we see this is the big thing. Uh, we see the reveal of Doctor TikTok's time machine, and I just wanted to point that out. How Kirby esque does that look? Uh, very intentionally Kirby with those little symbols along yeah, the side. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, and it's very cosmic. You know, more than a time machine, it, it feels like that kind of cosmic cube, cosmic awareness type of scene from Marvel Comics in the Bronze Age mm -hmm. to me. And then the last few pages of this issue, so... He activates American Spirit activates that time machine, and you get this scene where he's talking, and and uh, things are happening cosmically here. But more importantly to the story, so that, yeah, here in that panel, this the middle panel here on that page, Damien, that's Ladybug saying, "Remember, remember what he said," and they all start saying uh, "apocatastasis." Oh, so that comes back. Oh, that's Ladybug. Okay, apocatastasis, right? A real easy word to say. Yeah. <laughs> um. In the meantime, uh, uh, American Spirit is saying the world the world will be reborn in his vision, in his image, forever and ever and ever. And that's when uh, the, the, the flash of light. And then you get the final page, which is very Crisis-esque. If you remember Crisis on Infinite Earths, you, yes. get, you get the universe ending and everything goes to white, except for that bottom panel, which is really interesting. It's 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 almost white, but you you it's kind of like uh, uh, there's there's an opaque covering to it, but you can still see there, and it's magician pointing. I believe it's he's pointing whoop, pointing his wand. Drop my comic there, uh, pointing his wand at. It looks like Kid Victory in in the foreground there, and he's it's saying really hard to see clearly, but you're right, and he's yeah. saying apocastasis. Exactly. So in the previous podcast you mentioned i believe i can't remember exactly how you put it but that apocastasis means renewal or return to the beginning yes and i was looking at it a little bit in my rush before this um and apparently it's also a big term in uh judaic and christian theology and uh in stoic philosophy yes so um it has, it's both just a return to the primal universe, but it also has the whole idea of certain concepts, I think, of what the end of God's plan is. You know, will everything be returned to God and into its state of purity? And there's apparently were big debates amongst theologians in different Christian eras as to whether in apothic stasis, even the demons and devils would be returned to being angels again. Mm. Um, and I didn't have time to look further into it than that, but I just thought it was interesting that, and I don't know if, if they're aware of, of, of it being something that's debated in, in uh, obscure theology <laughs> circles, but, but I just thought it was interesting um, their use of that term. And they certainly use that, so much over and over in all the remaining issues that one feels they probably did explore the meaning of that word to some extent. Well, yeah, I, I will, I will just tell you that um, they did, it was very intentional. Um, and, uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it because there's a lot more stuff like that coming up in the very next issue. Right. Uh, which is issue number six. Awesome cover. I love that cover. And I guess, when we see when we see this cover, we now know Kid Vigilante must not be dead, in some form. It certainly looks that way, doesn't it? Although, yeah, with, although he's with, in kind of a hellish Hades. Yeah. Place. I don't think I picked up on that though when I first saw the cover. Yeah. But this is, you know, since we've been talking about this a week or two ago and looking at it more, I'm realizing more and more how much the colorist did add to everything. Um, so many of these covers would be completely have a completely different effect without the work that Rusty, the colorist, did. Yeah. Michael Rusty Drake. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I know my hats off to you because I think you realized that before me, how important he was. <laughs> well, it, you know, I, I think a lot of times we take the colorist in comics for granted. We focus so much on the writer and, and the penciler uh, of comics. And, and Rusty's colors on this series in particular has really opened up my eyes to what uh, a colorist brings to the table and adds to the overall story. So from now on, you know, I'm going to be definitely talking more about the colorist in terms of, of being a, an integral part of the story and the success of the story than I, than I have in the past. Right. Well, I wonder at what, this is total aside, but at what point we'll start seeing some colorists on the copyright pages? Because although they do, respect their colorist. Uh, this is copyright Landry Q Walker and Eric Jones. But I think one could argue that the colorists, at some point, the colorist involvement is so intense that maybe they get a, a piece of the ownership pie even. Mm -hmm. Now that's for creators to figure out amongst themselves. Yeah. <laughs> but certainly uh, colorists have more and more been mentioned on the covers and they, he is mentioned on the cover here. Um, his name is written as big as the other two. So they're kind of the big three in credits of this comic. Mm -hmm. But I think there are a few other comics I read where I think the colorist is very key. Do you read uh, Black Science? I, I did. I do not currently. When the colorist left and a different colorist took over, my interest in the comic went way down. Oh, not, it was not a bad colorist, but it just it became different. They changed the arc. Hmm. And uh, that colorist, um, I think it was Dean White, was kind of a key part of my enjoyment of, of black science. Hmm. Well, there you go. Testimony. <laughs> Testimony. <laughs> okay, so hmm. issue six, I'll read the front piece. They came to us thousands of years ago, gods, aliens, refugees of a fallen civilization. For centuries they ruled, intermingled with humanity, created, creating generation after generation of daemons, fairies, and demigods, the first generation of heroes and villains. And then one day something happened. Something terrible followed our rulers from their lost homeworld. The gods fell, defending the earth. Their empire crumbled, and only the most remote spark of their seed survived within our species. And they never told us what it was they had been running from. They never told us what it was that could frighten a god. So we've had Apollo before, and they kill Apollo, and then he's reborn, and then they beat him up, and they uh, take his blood <laughs> and leave him to regenerate again. So we've had a sense that there are beings that are more godlike, you know, that Apollo isn't just a name of a superhero. Um, and I think they mentioned that Apollo was the last of the Olympian gods surviving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and now we're going to get some more about that. Yes. And the, uh, the fake Silver Age cover is called, says they came from outer space and it shows Olympia, Olympian gods, um, Hades, Zeus, Poseidon. And this seems like the first one that is kind of a mock marvel comic book page instead yes. of a DC Silver Age page. Yeah, I, I noticed that as well. The artwork is much more Kirby-esque, a little bit. Um, and that they came from space. That's much more of a Stan Lee title than a, than a Silver <laughs> Age DC title. Yeah, yeah. Behold the dawn of the Olympic era and its shocking end. I want to read that comic book, by the way. Right, right. <laughs> much want to read that comic book. i went just about every every uh, uh uh retro page that we get those those first pages and every issue i want to read that comic right uh they also mentioned the uh um follow stone right and yeah. i did not pick up on this at all until just now because in later issues that Amphalo stone really is something to pay attention to. And exactly. I, I did not pick up on it that that was in this, on this page. And I didn't, uh, something I didn't pick up on, Damien, when you were just reading this, uh, the, the, the frontest text here, their empire crumbled and only the most remote spark of their seed survived within our species. So these gods, 
they're the reason that we have superpowers in this world, perhaps? Uh, apparently, yeah. So the superheroes are a a remainder of a remaining seed of some real gods that are part of our distant mythology of our world. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, there's the whole idea of superheroes being the modern mythology anyway. Exactly. Yes. And so yeah, I like that tie-in. Connecting it in a loop there. And and uh, don't forget, uh, Zeus in in uh, in our own Greek mythology was you know a bit of a a bit of a uh, he, he got around is what I'm he trying. He liked to, to spread the seed. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, he did. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, I, I wanted to mention, I just saw this too when you were reading. Uh, this is the first time that I've seen this in, in tiny print on the, in the inside cover uh, under the letters and logos um, uh, folks. It says the name Red Vengeance is used with permission from Chris Kempel and it gives a website. Uh, so this is, this is issue six and it appears, I just looked as you were talking, it, it appears in issue seven as well but not in issue eight and not in issue five. So is red vengeance, the Batman like character. Yeah. He's, he's kid vigilante's, um, you know, father. I noticed on another page, it mentioned red vengeance on Facebook, but this one says red vengeance.com. Right. And so, yeah, that's six. And then seven, uh, has the Facebook, uh, address facebook.com slash red vengeance comic. So, Boy, I wish I had seen that earlier because I would have looked that up and talked about it. But I'll I'll have to I'll have to check that out at some point. What what that's all about? Did they did uh, did Walker and Jones and Drake did they did they just use that? You know, because how many how many superhero names are out there that uh, that people have used over the years and. Or, or reuse from something else, and then you find out later. Oh gosh, I, I, you know, I this other person has this creation out there, this comic or this right. this web comic or strip or whatever, and they're using that name. It's like, oh, whoops. So I, so maybe retroactively they went and said, hey, we're really sorry about this. We didn't realize that. Yeah. <laughs> or, or maybe were they friends with the creator. Exactly. So yeah. I'm looking at RedVengeance.com. He looks. I'm having trouble with the website. He looks a bit like a Ultraman like character. Oh, okay. you know, one of those Japanese robotic kind of characters. Like most of these clicks aren't links aren't clicking. Maybe that's why they change it to the Facebook address. But then they have a whole bunch of other well known artists who've done drawings of Red Vengeance. Tommy oh. Lee Edwards has drawn him. Mike Rowengo. Jeff Parker has drawn him. I didn't even know Jeff Parker drew. Okay, so so that suggests that they did they did borrow the name and knew about the the uh, the history of that name and then maybe just decided to or were asked to add a um, a credit in in the on the cover there this looks has the looks of an uh, a website that someone did not complete so only some of the links on it work so there's not much detail so the only link on it that works is the gallery unless my unless my internet provider is blocking it for some reason. I'm not very happy with my internet provider right now. <laughs> if they have it. Uh. So, um, yeah. That's funny because there's so little about the Red Vengeance in here. I completely forgot his name was the Red Vengeance. Mm -hmm. I kind of keep going back to my assumption. He's vigilante and that's why his sidekick's kid vigilante. Mm -hmm. Well, he... Oh, he what there is a the prominent. Other, what was the twin or the other clone's name? Kid Victory. Kid Victory and Kid Vigilante. Yeah. Yeah. Which is very golden age, I think. Those kinds of names. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, going on to the issue. So the universe has been recreated uh, from the last issue, and we get an opening scene here of stuff we've seen before, which is, of course, Kid Vigilante being murdered by, by Jack. But mm -hmm. then as the panels go down on the page, he, uh, he appears. And he uh, looks like he's in the same place that he, Kid Vigilante and the magician um, visited to get Apollo's blood in an earlier issue. Right. You, you get that same, that same glowing yellow sphere uh, that it, I, I took it, Damien, that that's, that's where Kid Vigilante appeared in this realm. And then the, 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 the ball drops. 
uh, in in this in this on this page, and then he he's he appears at the bottom, and starts walking. Yeah, I did not at this point think the universe was being recreated. I thought we were seeing where Kid Vigilante went after death. Did you say the universe was being oh, you're, recreated? You're right. I did say that, and you're right. There is nothing to suggest that that is and the particularly situation Particularly as here. I flip the page, and he's walking through. Um, and there's a voice talking to him about your death, your life, your death. You exist only as long as I will it. That makes me feel he is in, I start suspecting he is in the Greek Hades, the uh, yes. afterlife, the underworld. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're, and, you're absolutely and right. We, I, I, I hope I'm not skipping too fast. But then, then we see Cerebus or Cerebus, the three-headed dog mm -hmm. who, uh, who guards the gates of Hades. And it, it's a lot of fun watching Kid Vigilante fight Cerebus. How do you say that? I, I get confused because they misspelled it in the Cerebus, the aardvark. <laughs> What's a misspelling of what I call Cerebus? The I thought it was, I, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I usually pronounce it Cerberus, but I'm probably wrong Cerberus. about it. That's right. That's how you do it. <laughs> I've just got it all mixed up in my head. Cerberus. Cerberus. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a long, fun sequence with lots of blood of him fighting Cerebus. Yeah, you're right. This issue does uh, almost entirely take place in that realm of uh, that where Kid Vigilante and Apollo are until the very end. And and then right. this this part of the story catches up with what we saw in the previous issue. And so I was just confusing those things right. in my brain. And And so we're seeing a lot. We're seeing what he's doing in Hades and we're seeing his sort of memories that led up to what we now realize is was his plan all along that exactly. included his own death. Right. So, you know, you had mentioned how at first they thought they'd do this as a six issue series, mm -hmm. and this is issue six. And I wonder if this, once they got to this idea of him being reborn in hell in the 80s, that, that they wanted to spend more time on it. They didn't want to rush through it so much. Because yeah. this does seem like we were rushing through the plot, and now we're most of the plot is resting for the moment while we see something happening elsewhere and find out more of the back, the backstory of the plan. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I, and I'll also point out that, uh, I, th I'm pretty certain they were joking, but one of the, one of the reporters at Newsarama or comics Alliance, whichever one I can't remember, uh, asked them, you know, did, did you ever basically, did you did you think about just ending it with uh, everything going white uh, as they did? And uh, like I said, I think they were joking, and but I, but I, they did they did indicate, yeah, that they thought about it. <laughs> Could you imagine if that's what we got? We got to the end of issue six, and that's what happened. <laughs> right. Every, everything goes everything ends, and and it goes white, and then we're done. What an unsatisfying ending that would be. And of course, that's what they they also said was that that would be hugely unsatisfying for for uh, many readers, if not all of us. <laughs> I wanted so to point out- Here's a horrible confession of mine. I have never read the entirety of Crisis on Infinite Earths. <gasps> Damien. And, and as we saw at the end of last issue, this is referring to that. And I have a general understanding of Crisis on Infinite Earths, but I just never got through the whole thing. Um, <laughs> That's okay. Do, do we, um, I, I assume this part does not have an equivalent in that. Uh, you mean the part where Kid Vigilante is in this other realm? Right. Not not a direct one, not not to my recollection. Um, maybe some of the sequences in uh, the antimatter universe could be analogous in some ways, but but definitely not in, in a direct fashion, no. Right. So I don't know if, you know, because so much of what happens in these comics, I can see the antecedents in the history of comics. This particular issue with, you know, going, getting yourself killed and sent to Hades and to rush ahead on what this whole issue is about, rush to Hades to recruit the spirits of the dead gods in your battle. I haven't seen that particular thing in a comic book, but yeah. maybe it refers to something. Yeah. And what a, what a plan. What? <laughs> what a crazy, scary plan to get your, yeah. literally die. Last ditch effort. Uh, you have to, yeah, literally die. Yeah, he. I mean, he has. He. There, there's, there's the Joseph Campbell um, hero's journey 
right? That whole process where um, whether it's usually figurative, but sometimes literally the hero has to has to die, you know, quote unquote die, and then be reborn is transformed and then comes back and basically saves the day. Well, that's right. exactly what Kid Vigilante is doing, except he literally did die. Um, that's although a very his spirit. Good point. And there are tons of fantasy novels and such where the heroes literally have to go down into the underworld to the land of the dead. For some reason, immediately this uh, Philip, Philip Pullman trilogy of his, I remember reading that and hearing interviews with him where he was doing the hero's journey. Um, his dark materials, I think it was a very popular fantasy young adult trilogy. But anyway, um, usually the heroes are still alive, but somehow find an entrance into the land of the dead. Mm -hmm. But in this case, he has to literally die. And I feel like um, Landry and Rusty, you know, really go to town on their on their artwork of showing us Hades. I the the myth mythology lover in me really just really enjoyed these sequences. Yeah, uh, yeah, beautifully done, beautifully drawn and colored, and you know, in the way not even though there's Kirby references elsewhere, this is not the way Kirby would have done it. It's very the very unique to them, I guess, or or at least not drawn from Kirby in this case. I mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I too was struck by the the whole uh, uh, connections to Greek mythology, or the, or just the the blatant reproductions Most of, more, uh, of stuff from Greek mythology. So, because I loved that as a kid. Yeah, yeah, and comics have often had great connections to mythology, um, but this is just done really well. And we talked about how the the Olympic the Olympic pantheon shows up in. Uh, a couple of issues of the Teen Titans, in fact. Right. And of course, they're through and through Olympic and Norse mythology keeps reappearing in, in Marvel comics all the time. <laughs> right. Um, I want to just jump back uh, for a quick discussion about there's a there's a flashback scene here between Kid Vigilante and Red Vengeance. And they're they're right. in that same room with Kid Victory in that tube, that that uh, stasis tube that uh, was re referenced in the previous uh, volume of the, of the comic. And Red Vengeance is such a dick in this. Uh, totally, they, yeah. yeah. So he, he talks about how, uh, Kid Vigilante, your brother was, one, was our best hope for the future. All my plans, my son. Now all I have is you, referring to Vigilante. And I'm afraid you won't be enough. And that, that final panel... Where he wa Red Vengeance walks away, and you know, with v Kid Vigilante standing there, and and both, you know, basically there's nothing in the background. You see the floor a little bit, yeah. but it fades into white in the top, and just the the way the shadow extends, trying to connect, you know, yeah. with with his father, and it's not quite reaching. It's just oh, yeah. wonderfully done by by Jones and and uh, Drake, showing Very that. Very good point. That is an amazingly good panel, and it just emphasis the emotional gut punch of your father saying you're not good enough <laughs> yeah <laughs> and you know and what and what teenage boy especially um hasn't felt that disconnect with the father and right. the 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 pang of wanting to be able to uh live up to the father's expectations right. and ple please the father and 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 knowing that you can't and or or, or won't be able to for some reason yeah it, this is familiar territory. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the, I can't, do they ever say that he's a clone? Because that that's kind of where I wondered when he says, he refers to the other brother as my son. Like, is Kid Vigilante a clone of Kid Victory? Or maybe that's just not important, but I, I keep wondering if there's some other clue that I saw and then forgot that. No, I, you're right. There, there is something later in this issue that I, that I was going to point out. I think it's in this issue, this issue where that, where that's discussed. So. Right. Well, and eventually beyond the emotional abuse, <laughs> uh, eventually to prepare his lesser son for this, um, thing he puts him in a contraption and and kid vigilante says will it hurt and the father says yes more than you can possibly imagine and then he pulls the switch like as if i'm happy to hurt you know i have no problem with you going through 
Well, unimaginable pain yeah. to fulfill my plans. <laughs> yeah. So if you if you look at that panel there, he just says yes, and just the look on his face it's it's almost almost like contempt that right. that that this boy would ask that question. Right. And maybe I'm just reading into it, but. <laughs> So it feels oh. again kind of this emotional abuse and physical abuse of children to me. And oh, then that's right. This is a a great image which I feel like I still need to go back and study for all that's probably packed in here of the visions that Kid Vigilante is given by his father's machine that is giving him unimaginable pain. Right. So we we should probably step back though and explain that just a little bit. There so basically, there's there's two stories going on here. We get you get the the the, uh, the the main timeline, which is Kid Vigilante and Hades fighting Cerberus and heading towards Apollo. Apollo's freaking out about that. We'll come back to that. Uh, and but then there's the flashback that we we've been talking about, um, and uh, Vigilante's talking to Red Vengeance and. Red Vengeance talks about that the mathematical equation that the, this uh, Weisinger's theorem of multidimensional transcendence, you've read this, right? And, and Vigilante says, of course. Then you understand the, the, the equation that proves an infinite number of alternate universes should exist. And this is very important to the whole story. And yet they do not. What we can detect are simply echoes, the energy signatures of non-existent alternate versions of Earth Every other world in the universe is constant while the Earth is in, a, is in a state of flux. Furthermore, it appears that instead of coexisting in harmonic synchronicity, you know, just like, just like uh, the, the, the parallel Earth concepts of, of, D, of the DC universe, you know, we talked about the, um, or it's been talked about in many, many different comics over the, the past 75, well, not 75 years, but uh, since the Silver Age dawned in DC comics, um, that uh, the, each parallel Earth is on a different plane, but uh, uh, has a different vibrational synchronicity. Syn right. Synchronicity. Or, or any, anyway, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> continuing on, uh, every reality is built instead upon the bones of the last. Every new Earth overwrites the previous. And, and uh, Red Vengeance reveals that he spent decades analyzing this energy. Uh, he's allowed to decode a temporal echo of the next event, the next one, which, and then we get that scene uh, where the heroes are all standing there in fear and awe and just before they die. And, and that's something that we talked about in the last discussion. Right. Um, so he says, my life, the lives of all my allies will be lost. We will not survive the crisis that lies before us. I'm glad you brought us back to this page because in my rushing ahead, <laughs> I forgot that this is where this information was. This is, I mean, already we know this is a commentary on all kinds of comic book things, but now this focuses us on a commentary on a certain aspect or maybe two aspects of, of comic book history. Um, clearly this is a reference to the crisis on infinite earths and all, all the other things that have come after that, right? I mean, there's been so many permutations since then of the ideas about infinite Earths. Um, it's kind of an, now, see, here's my flaw. My under, at the end of Crisis of Infinite Earths, do they shrink it all back down to one Earth again? Yes, the multiverse right. becomes so a kind monoverse. Of like we've just found out that the Crisis of Infinite Earths happened and someone shrunk us back down to one Earth. But it's also a theme that then gets developed more and more, I think, of looking at the history of comics as people keep getting rewritten and rebooted. There's all these past selves that aren't quite the same. And, and so even without the crisis of infinite Earths, just if you took superheroes as a reality, as we've seen in comic books, someone, some outside force has come in and kept rewriting us. <laughs> meaning the creators of comics. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it, it, this this series gets very meta at times. Right. So so this is where a real meta a new meta thread or is is made explicit um which I think becomes for me the main thing on the meta level that goes on for the remaining two issues after this before the series ends. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned just now the the um the crisis and everything that's come after it. In my notes, I put here, uh, 
every new earth overwrites the previous. And then I put crisis, zero hour, 52, infinite crisis, final crisis, flashpoint, secret wars. <laughs> right. Those are just the ones off the top of my head. You know, convergence, how, multiversity. There, yeah, exactly. That's happened recently. <laughs> exactly. There you go. Um, let's see here. Uh, so they, they, they continue talking. Oh, this is important too. So we just, I just said 52. Um, between then and now, this is Red Vengeance talking, this fluctuation of antimatter, and that's really important to crisis itself, antimatter, has appeared at least 51 times. <laughs> and so there, there's the next one, Fifty-two. I just love that. I, I just love that the meta the meta stuff of it. I mean, it's it's obvious if you're if you're if you're um, a fan of superhero comics and you follow a lot of different right. a lot of different um, uh, comics. But um, I so I wonder. Yeah, I wonder how if someone is coming into this 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 series, not having a lot of history with uh, say DC and Marvel, especially especially DC. Uh, how much is it important? Uh, maybe if they don't get it, um, you know, or is this just, is this merely one of those kinds of Easter eggs where, you know, when you and I go to a, a Marvel or DC movie and they, or, or watch, you know, a, a superhero show on television, they throw in those Easter eggs where to people who don't know this history and don't know these characters, it just, it's just this thing there this detail that's not important to them, but for us, we, you know, we all, we get all squee about it. <laughs> well, I think it also reveals, I think even if you didn't know all of that, I think there's, uh, it's kind of cool that it's revealing that, cause we already learned that um, the president, the American spirit has been re busy rewriting history um, with his time machine. So it just sort of confirms that um that kind of cool plot if you didn't even know about infinite crisis and all of that uh the 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 plot the idea of someone who's rewritten history over and over again and we just barely we vaguely think something's wrong and something's wrong with the world and then we discover oh it's been rewritten 51 times since 1940 or something like that and and that's why um so that's a, a cool idea one can also imagine like someone who uses a time machine to rewrite history over, keep fixing little details would slowly go. Of course, there's another explanation for what's wrong with him, but slowly go crazier and crazier over time as they keep trying to fix the world and instead become more and more of this mad, madman, mad dictator of the world. You know, actually I would have loved to have seen that story instead of uh, what we get as in terms of why he's doing this and, and for what reason. Right. That actually, that, that Me too. is a more interesting that's story. That's what I thought we were heading towards in this issue. Okay. See, I, was, I wasn't even thinking along those terms as I was reading this. Um, so in my first reading of this, as we get revealed exactly who the American spirit is, I think, in the next issue, I was very disappointed with that explanation. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it more now with the rereading because I'm, you know, like noticing the details with they came from space and all of that kind of thing. So I still have more problems with the last issues of this than with the rest of the series, but I like it better now on the reread than I did the first read. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned, Damien, uh, the rewriting time since you said 1940s or something, but Red Vengeance does, here's another Easter egg, here's another uh, throwback. He he says, I've been able to trace the energy signature backwards in time as far as October of 1956. Uh, why didn't I catch that? Damien, what happened in October 1956? Do you do you remember? Remember? That is in essence the first reboot of the DC universe when the uh, Silver Age who was the first? Was it the Flash or was it someone else? Yes. That that is when so that's the official beginning of the Silver Age. Yep. And it's when DC decided to revive their superheroes, but redo them. So the Flash before that was not Barry Allen. Who was he? Jay Garrick. Jay Garrick. And he got his powers from Mercury. And they redid him as uh, with a new costume as Barry Allen, who got his powers from lightning striking some chemicals and spilling all over him. Yeah. Um, 
And ever since then, we've constantly redone why, who the superheroes are, what they look like, and everything. That's happened multiple times. Yeah. So that is a huge Easter egg um, that I missed for even more explicitly saying to the experienced reader, we are commenting on <laughs> comics. <laughs> Well, there's a, and there's a lot of things on these two pages uh, that I have noted here. Um, I mentioned the, the antimatter and crisis. We, we talked about the start of the Silver Age with the, the, the appearance of Flash. Also, um, there is they talk about the global war, how it ended with the miniaturization of Tokyo. I, I in my notes I said, is that a nod to Brainiac? You know those old Silver Age stories where Brainiac shrunk all those cities. Right, I'm sure it is, and of course, it's a nod to Hiroshima and Nagasaki in a in a way too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But instead of instead of ending the war with a nuclear bomb, we end it with some kind of super science from comic books. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, let's see. No, I guess that I guess that was it. I just wanted to point out those few things. So, and that that uh, we're, we're, this is, there's just a lot in some of these pages. There's the again that that same page where we're, we're discussing those details. But uh, notice that Kid Vigilante, how he's reacting to what Red Vengeance is, is saying. And it's not, it's not the enormity of, of the situation. It's not the, the fact that the universe is going to apparently die. It's that Red Vengeance himself, as, as Kid right. Vigilante says, whispers, you're going to die? Right. Just that 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 emotional connection is just another the another puppy loves his father. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, it's also, I mean, again, it's not played up, but I can imagine a cool comic book centered around discovering that your own persona has been rebooted fifty-one times in the past. You know, you I keep getting rewritten. <laughs> they could do so many miniseries, you know, six issue, whatever stories about every little thing that we're pointing out in this universe. I, and, and I would buy them all. <laughs> yeah. You could take a very kind of Philip K. Dick approach to the, to the rebooting of comics. If you went deep into the character's experience of being rebooted. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's a, I want, I want them to write that story. Damn it. <laughs> maybe uh, you will have to write that story. Uh, maybe. Yeah. Uh, I want to jump ahead here to this page where uh, so Kid Vigilante is making his way through Hades towards Apollo. And then we get this splash page showing uh, towards the top and moving down towards the center of it. You get you get these Greek gods. And, and we, I wanted to mention this before, but it wasn't appropriate at the time we were talking. But notice how everybody is who is talking in these text boxes. They all have different colors. And right. if you. It's not quite clear on this page, but um, if you look at the, the the busts of these gods, they have their symbols, their sigils, and they're all they're the same colors as the text boxes that they're that they're that correspond on the page. So I, I thought that was a nice way to to tie the god to who is talking, and we've been seeing that throughout this issue. I can't. In my copy, I can't. Uh, one is yellow, but the rest I can't really make. Yeah, out I, on that page, it's where where you can see that better. Yeah, on okay, that page, right. it's really hard. Another, flip another page or so, and the colors are more. Yep, distinct. there you go. Yeah, here, here, here's a better view of it, where the colors are much more distinct. Right. And so what we have here is, um, let's since we we both love the the Greek gods, Damien, I wanted to just point these out. So we have um, uh, Hermes. And Artemis, who is traditionally Apollo's sister, so that, that's Artemis, Hermes. I'm going to come back to the, the the lady in the with the yellow circle there, and then on the right side of that page there was Mars. Oh, sorry, <laughs> Ares. I don't want to. They're not Roman gods; they're Greek gods. Uh, Ares and um, oh gosh, who who is that? That is. I have. Hold on. I gotta. I gotta look at my notes here. Oh, you figured out who they all are? I mean... Well, I'm guessing Aphrodite and Athena is the other one. Uh, so I looked up a lot. I looked up all of the, so uh, the Hera symbols. Hera and Zeus are not here? Well, these are the children of Hera and Zeus, including Apollo. So it's... Right. Well, wait. Our, Ares is not... Is, I can't remember and my... Ares my, would be a brother of Zeus. Well, but, but in many... In some of the stories, they were they were... Never mind. I, I 
I, I'm forgetting my Greek mythology, but you're right. So maybe there could be many different versions too. Because <laughs> I, I was thinking that that in some cases, you know, they were they were they were brother. Well, no, like like Zeus and Hera, technically were brother and sister, but then they married. If I remember my mythology correctly. So maybe I'm getting that confused with right. People were always marrying their sisters. Yeah. Well, there was no one else in existence to marry. Right? Exactly. Because that's, they were the only ones who existed. But okay, so maybe that is Hera there. But I but I was thinking in terms of the children of Zeus and Hera. So I wondered if it was uh, Demeter or or Hestia. I wasn't quite sure who that particular character was. Right. And you said you were going to come back to the one that kind of has an anarchy symbol. Yeah, that that's who I'm referring to. The. Oh. The, the one with the yellow symbol. Uh -huh. So that, that's a symbol it, that's a symbol for Earth. And so I was thinking, well, it, it, that's not really Hera's symbol from, from my interpretation. So I was thinking, well, maybe, maybe it's Gaia, but Gaia is, is more of, Gaia was- Gaia is a Titan, so she's a sister yes, of Kronos. Exactly, and, and, and the mother of Zeus. So that didn't make sense. So then I thought, well, who are the other Earth-related uh, Greek gods that were the uh, that was the the daughter of zeus and hera and and so that i that led me to demeter and he, or hestia it might be somebody else i i just couldn't find uh, right. another uh, is that another even female name. it's kind of uh, ambiguous well that's true i did take it to be female but you're right it could be another but but it being earth earth uh an earth symbol from based on my research uh earth is usually uh, um, associated with the, a female presence. So that's, that's what I took it as. Right. Well, what we're doing is kind of like a DVD commentary track here, but it would be great if the creators of this book did <laughs> one. You know, I did think about um, uh, tweeting at uh, these guys and asking them some of these questions. Uh -huh. So I, I probably will do that uh, in the future and maybe do a, a commentary on our commentary. <laughs> <laughs> with with that information but at least one comic book creator does make a sort of audio podcast like um commentary track on each issue and that is a uh, xander cannon on kaiju max so you can listen to him for an hour or more talk about what he was thinking with each page of each issue of kaiju max <laughs> oh that's neat i haven't read that so i i, I might have to check I that I'm out i'm kind of an addict to kaiju max it just the first six issues just ended he's on a break he's calling them seasons so season two is coming up next year um so i assume the trade will be coming out soon completely different from this but but a, a very cool comic very cool and unique comic book but ba back to this <laughs> So you you uh, you brought up the whole whether you know the the whole clone situation or whatever, and that's on the next page. That's where they talk about um, Red Vengeance talks about this was meant to be your brother's mission. When I cloned you both, right. his DNA was altered, his brain mutated so that he could slowly process the temporal data. Since you're his twin, the same could be done for you, but your creation was not intended for that purpose. So. So that explains a lot more of Red Vengeance's saying you're not good enough and, and yeah. such, even though because of the withholding of that information, we focused on the emotional effect on, um, on Kid Vigilante. We now understand more why Red Vengeance, he created these two kids as tools. Yeah. Not as children. Even Still. though they are perfectly human. Still, he, he's such a dick. <laughs> he is totally a dick. You know, Batman gets a lot of grief um, in, uh, in in continuity from his his family about about not being emotionally connected and and whatnot. Right. And this guy makes uh, 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 puts Batman to shame in in that department. Yeah. I have to say, Frank Miller would like this Batman though. <laughs> Well, you know, Dark Knight Three is coming, so we'll see. We'll see yeah, how it compares. I'm really excited about that. <laughs> uh, okay, um, so Vigilante finally reaches Apollo. Apollo is freaking out. Uh, right. With what you know, basically, he drops to his knees, saying, "Please, I don't." I can't read right. backwards. I don't way. blame him. I mean, he's been, yeah, he's been sort of beaten in a torturous kind of way multiple times by Kid Vigilante now. Um, so he's kind of a whipped dog in a way, even yeah. though he's... Please don't hurt me anymore. Right. 
you know, we t- you, you, you've talked before, Damien, about how um, maybe a maybe vigil- kid vigilante isn't necessarily the hero of the story. And just just this scene makes me really question that that idea of of him being the hero of the story because of the way that like you say you know he's been uh, right. he he tortured apollo he, he tortured apollo at least twice and it looks like he might be doing it again for some reason right. and here's apollo on his knees supplicate supplicated to to this other character who has no superpowers and yet he's afraid and and is just he just doesn't want to be hurt right. anymore. It's just, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. Considering how, where we started with Apollo at the very beginning of, of this series with issue number one, and then we get to this point. I, I, my heart just goes out to this character. Yeah. Uh, but, but of course, um, vigilante does say, I, I didn't come here to fight you, even though you know, he's got this sword and shield, and he's been fighting his way through Cerberus and these, and these spirits, uh, you know, I, I came here to save you. So that's, at least there's that. Right. Well, in a, so then after this scene where Apollo is, you know, a beaten dog because of all the torture he's gone through, then we go back to seeing Red Vengeance for his purely unemotional plans. You know, the side effect of that is to torture a uh, kid vigilante. So it's almost a cycle of of cruelty or... Stuff, but it's funny because I keep I feel like we intentionally or unintentionally constantly flip flopped on our feelings about Kid Vigilante. (laughs) He also has all these Christ like moments. He's even in kind of a Christ like pose when he said, "I came here to save you." In this final moment with uh, oh, you're right. And then couple that with the with the next page where he's strapped on that table and it's right kind of his son being sacrificed by his father. Like my God. I had, I did not I was not going down that that path when I when I was rereading this but it it became very apparent as you were talking. Right. Wow. Wow. Yeah, See now I re- I really want to go talk to to down, Eric Jones and whatnot. to be tortured to death. <laughs> yeah. Uh so then Kid Vigilante gets the gets the knowledge, the foresight. So that right. that really so that in my notes I said that's his superpower. He really does have a superpower. It's just a different kind. Right. And and then we see there's a big uh, the big reveal uh, of the big bad in this, and that is Kronos, the Titan. Right. Do we understand fully what he is yet, or does it take till next issue? Well, I do think you see chaos. Do they say? Oh, they do say Kronos. They do, but you have to know your Greek mythology to right. understand what that means to these to the the characters in the situation. Right. And of course, these are Greek mythology who we've been told are aliens who once acted as gods upon earth, but now are sort of dead, but still in this afterlife in Hades. Mm-hmm. So this version of Kronos may be slightly different than oh, sure. than the Kronos of Greek mythology. This is another incredibly cool drawing and coloring by, by our art team. Yeah, thank you for pointing that. I was going to do that myself. I guess who Kronos is linked to perhaps is not revealed to the next issue. That's correct. Um, and then we get the whiteout effect again, again bringing up the whole crisis kind of thing. And we get the word apocastasis again. Yep. Again, several times. Maybe if I take my glasses off, I can see what's going on in the fade of that panel <laughs> it's kind of a similar panel to the panel of the last issue only but and sorry i had i had to take my glasses off and peer at it close yeah i kind of lost you on the audio there damien um did you lose me on the audio i'm sorry I was just saying it's a similar panel to last time, right? But, but a more of a close up. Yes. And I had to take my glasses off to see it. Uh, there, there. These this creative teams reminding me how old I am. <laughs> so with my regular vision, I just I don't see enough. I had to take my glasses off and peer really closely at this panel to see what it was. So it's some kind of tie back to uh, issue five. 
where we end we also end with a fade out and a close a fading in close up of the magician doing something magical to kid vigilante well kid victory actually in this in this kid, case oh was it kid Vit victory yeah. how did you know that <clears throat> if you uh because it's it's the you can see the uh the mask that on, on his mouth the, the breathing apparatus on his mouth that we saw in the stasis tube. Wow, you were way better at, at interpreting it's, faint visuals than I it's, am. It's really <laughs> hard to see. Say that I could see that could be interpreted that way and that you were right, but I, I missed that. So at the end of issue five, was that also Kid Victory? Yes. Okay. At least that's how I took it. Right. And that's where I will end this discussion on issues 5 and 6 of Danger Club. If you'd like to leave feedback about these issues or any of the other issues that we've discussed in previous episodes, please do so. You can email me at longboxreview at gmail.com, or you can tweet at me at longboxreview, or you can leave comments at the blog longboxreview.com. I want to thank Damien, once again, for joining me in this discussion, and please join us for the final installment wherein we discuss issues 7 and 8, including the alternate ending issue of Danger Club. Thanks for listening.